This is a pre-lab lecture video for experiment 3b, the determination of the molar mass of an unknown acid. So here are the experiment objectives. First of all, we want to determine the identity of an unknown acid by comparing its molar mass to a list of possible acids. The next thing we want to be able to do is to determine the molar mass of an unknown acid by titrating it with a standardized base solution. And the last thing we want to be able to do is to write a professional technical report that clearly communicates how the experiment was carried out and the validity of the results. So we're going to determine the molar mass of our unknown. And then once we know the molar mass, we'll compare it to a list of possible unknowns. So we'll identify which one it actually is. And then we'll write a report to explain how we did that. So as we set up our experiment, here's some information that's specific to this experiment. First of all, we want to standardize our diluted sodium hydroxide solution with a known mass of KHP, and this way we can find the exact molarity of the sodium hydroxide. Because the sodium hydroxide actually comes as solid pellets, if we were to buy just so solid sodium hydroxide, and that solid sodium hydroxide actually absorbs water from the air, so it's hard to determine its mass accurately. But the KHP, that potassium hydrogen phthalate, is a good primary standard, which means that you can weigh it out very accurately to determine its mass. And so knowing that it's an acid, a monoprotic acid, we can find out the number of moles in our sodium hydroxide solution. So we standardize this sodium hydroxide solution using the KHP. We're then going to titrate about a gram of your unknown acid with your standardized solution. So the standardized sodium hydroxide solution. So using the molarity of your sodium hydroxide and knowing whether or not you have a monoprotic or triprotic or diprotic acid, you can figure out the number of moles of acid in your solution. So remember with the titration of an acid with a base, you're going to be using phenolphthalein as an indicator. And you'll start adding your solution to your flask. And remember you want to swirl your flask. And as you start to see pink start to appear because you have indicator in there, the phenolphthalein, once you start seeing the pink, you need to slow down. And you want to stop at the very slight pink color. So this is your end point. This tells you when to stop. But if your solution gets really pink, you've gone too far. So you over titrated the solution. One of the things you should notice about this experiment is that it's very similar to your Chem 1A lab practical. So it's a very similar titration. This time we're focusing on writing the technical report and making sure you still retain those skills that you gained in Chem 1A. Now you'll need to use a blue book for writing down all of your observations and what you did. So this is going to be your lab notebook. So there's lots of information for you on Blackboard. One of the things that's on there is, first of all, how to format your references in ACS style. So this is the style of the American Chemical Society. This is a common uh, way that we reference in the chemical industry. There's also a grading rubric so you'll know exactly how you'll be graded. There's an example research paper that shows you the components and the writing style. So you can use that as a guide when you start to write your paper. What do you, what do you include? What's in included in each part? How do I write it up? Like past tense. Um, and using third person. Those kind of things are what you're going to be looking at. Also, you, there you'll find the report template. So you'll download that Word document, and in that Word template, it gives you all the instructions of how to set up your formal lab report. You also find an example of a lab notebook, so an example blue book, and how to keep your data. Now you will be working as individuals, so there will be no lab partners, and you will each be assigned one of the following unknowns: either a monoprotic acid a diprotic acid or a triprotic acid. So it's very important that you write down what type of acid that you have. Now if you need a reminder on how to use a burette, please see the handout on Blackboard. There are burette reading cards to help you read the volume properly. So remember, read it at eye level out to two decimal places and you need to have a backdrop behind it, a white background so you can easily identify the bottom of the meniscus to read the volume properly. You'll also want to record your masses to the fourth decimal place. So not doing so will negatively affect your grade. So there are balances in the balance room that go out to 
three decimal places and there are some that go out to four decimal places. Make sure you use the balances that go out to four decimal places. You'll do each titration three times and then you're going to calculate the standard deviation with those measurements. Once you've identified your unknown, calculate your absolute and your percent error and you'll report this in your formal lab report. Now in table one, you'll find this in the template that's given on Blackboard. You want to fill in the table with the molecular formula and molar masses of the possible acids. Be sure to subscript the numbers in the chemical formula. For example, for sulfuric acid, H2SO4, the two and the four should be subscript. Do not leave them as uppercase letters. Now, you can get help for writing your formulas of the acids. You can get help either from your textbook, the Sigma Aldrich Chemical Company, the Merck Index Online, or the Spectral Database for Organic Compounds. So in that table, there are monoprotic, diprotic, and triprotic acids that are listed. You only need to list those that you're assigned. So let's say you're given a diprotic unknown. So you can delete the information or the lines for the monoprotic and the triprotic acid. So you'd only give the values associated with the diprotic acid because your unknown is a diprotic acid. So here's some advice on keeping a lab notebook. Now if you pull up the example lab notebook that's found on Blackboard, you should notice a couple of things about it. First of all, it gives a title for the experiment. After that, then there should be either an introduction or it should list the objectives as to what the goal of the lab is and how it will be accomplished. Then it gives the references such as this lab is based on experiment 3B in you know, our, our lab manual. And it gives the, the reference of where we get the idea for the lab experiment. And then it also gives important equations such as reaction schemes or experiment setups are drawn. So it gives figures and pictures of what's going on. So in yours, you're going to want to draw or write the equation for how an acid is neutralized by a base, and particularly whether or not it's a monoprotic or triprotic or diprotic acid. And there is also a list of materials, and it also includes important properties in who made the, those compounds. And that's important because sometimes manufacturers will make something and then they'll have to recall it so maybe you find out your reaction isn't working or your reaction is running a little bit high or a little bit low and you figure out oh there's actually a problem with the way the manufacturer produced it and they had problems with a lot so that way if there's a problem really like related like that you can figure that out if you list uh, who made the, who made the compound notice also in the lab notebook that it gives any safety concerns so maybe if you're using something caustic or dangerous, you need to put that in there. And then the procedures are given. So this is exactly what was done. So very detailed notes as to what was done in the experiment. Now, if it isn't written down in the notebook, it did not happen. And after each page is completed or where you stop for the day, each page needs to be signed and dated. Because a lab notebook is actually a legal document. And so we need to know when you inserted the information by when you date it. And if it's not written down in the lab notebook, it did not happen. Also, some things that you should notice from the example lab notebook. Notice how all the calculations are given inside the lab notebook. The handwriting is neat. Observations are given to clearly describe what happened. It's well organized and easy to follow. And headings help keep things organized. So maybe you need a heading for, you know, standardizing the sodium hydroxide solution. And another section, another heading would be titrating the unknown acid. So those kind of things help keep things nice and neat. But you need to make sure that you write everything in your lab notebook as you're going. You're not allowed to write it on another sheet of paper and then transfer it into your lab notebook. You have to write it in your lab notebook as you do it. Now another thing that you should notice about the lab book is that it's written in pen. You cannot use pencil because remember this is a legal document. If you're writing in pencil that means that you can erase things and change things but we need to see permanent ink in there. Now if you make a mistake that's fine. So just simply draw a line through the mistake but don't scribble it out. And the example notebook that we give you this person did not do this very well. 
Now the reason why we want you to draw a line through it rather than scribbling it out is sometimes you accidentally delete or scribble out the wrong information and you need to be able to read through what it was previously there. So if you just draw a simple line through it, you can still read it in case you need to come back and you weren't supposed to scribble that part out. Now if you paste something into your lab notebook, it also needs to be signed and dated. And I think I have a duplicate here, but references are also given such as this lab is based on experiment 3B. Now for the pre-lab for this experiment, start filling in your blue book with your title, your introduction, your list of reagents, your safety concerns, and your reactions. Then write a procedure for the experiment in your blue book. And there are two ways that you can approach this. You can first make two columns for your procedure. One column is for what you project to do, and the other column will is where you'll make notes and check off in the lab that that part was done. So if I was to bring in my blue notebook, you'd see in this first column here, I'd tell myself, weigh out one gram of KHP to four decimal places. Then I need to dissolve that KHP in about 25 mils of water. So in the right hand side is where I give what I actually did in my notes and observations. So here I weighed out 1.0231 grams. So this is exact mass I weighed out. And then here I just simply check mark that I dissolved the KHP in about 25 mils of water. And I noted that the KHP was clear and colorless. So that's one of the ways that you can do it. So making the two columns where one is what you're supposed to do and the second column is um, kind of the notes related to that. Now the other thing that you can also do is you can write out all of your steps but leave extra space in between those steps to make notes. So rather than it more being more vertical it's more horizontal. Now on Blackboard you'll also find the grading rubric. You'll be graded on the scientific content and accuracy. You'll also be graded on your calculations and how well you did on your significant figures. You'll be graded on grammar and style. You'll also be graded on the data presentation, so your figures um, and any schemes that you use in your tables. You'll also be graded on the accuracy and the precision of your data. You'll also be graded on your references, so using references and making sure that they're well formatted. And then you'll also be graded on keeping a lab notebook, so that will be your blue book. So you can print the grading rubric from Blackboard and look at the, the criteria in more detail. Now here I just want to look at some of the components of a scientific formal lab report and using the, the lab template. So there's a lab template, so there's a formal report template on Blackboard. It's a Word document and this should really make things easy for you. It has instructions and everything laid out in it for you. But the basic components of a scientific formal paper first thing is the the title of the paper and in the template all you've got to do is highlight the section that says title and start typing your title over that section and it'll come out in the in the correct format so it'll be Times New Roman with 22 font and centered then after the title you have your author's names so since you're the only person writing this and you're the only person working on it it'll just be your name and then after the author's name is the author address, so that will be the Kim 1B Lab, Department of Chemistry. And after the author address is the author email address. Then the receive date, so this is the date that we're going to put in that the lab report is due, so when you turn it into your lab instructor. After you put the receive date, there's the abstract, and the abstract is basically gives a summary of the experiment, what happened, and some of the major conclusions or findings. But an abstract should be very short and concise. And for our experiment, probably two or three sentences should suffice. After the abstract is the introduction. The introduction lays the groundwork for what's going to be done. It gives more of the theory and kind of sets the tone for the paper. Now after the introduction, you have the experimental. The experimental contains all the nitty gritty details of exactly what was done. And after your experimental, then you present your results and you discuss the results. What do your results mean? How do you interpret the data? And then after your, your results and your discussion becomes the comments and conclusions. So this kind of wraps up the summary of your paper and what kind of conclusions you can make 
about your your data and your experiment. After the comments and conclusion are your acknowledgments, so you can acknowledge anybody that gave you any assistance or help. So these are the people that helped you but did not contribute enough intellectually to be an author on the paper. Sometimes when we list acknowledgments, maybe it was somebody that helped proofread or maybe as a funding agency that gave you the money to do the lab experiment or something of that nature. Then after the acknowledgments is a list of supporting information. So this basically tells the reader what kind of additional information that you have for them in the supporting information documentation. So after that you have your references and then you actually give your supporting information after the references. So you'll add that at the very end. Now some grammatical and style errors to avoid. So the example paper should give you good examples of what to do. So you only want to use third person. First person should be avoided and second person should never be used. So a good example would be the potassium hydrogen phthalate was diluted to 25 mils with water. What you don't want to do is say I dissolve 3.4 grams of potassium hydrogen phthalate in 25 mils of water. So we want to avoid that first person in using I. But you definitely don't want to say you dissolve 3.5 grams of KHP in 25 mils of water. You never want to use second person in a scientific paper. Now remember your experiment has already been done so you want to use past tense. No future tense, no present tense. So use the past tense. If you have a number that's less than one, you need a zero in front of the decimal place. So saying 0 0.89 mils is good, 0.89 mils not good. If you use an abbreviation, you must first define it and then you can use that abbreviation for the rest of the paper. For example, if we're talking about potassium hydrogen phthalate, we can abbreviate it KHP and we can separate that off with commas. And so this was titrated with sodium hydroxide. So then for the rest of the paper, rather than typing out potassium hydrogen phthalate, I can simply type out KHP. But the first time I use that abbreviation KHP, I need to define it first. Now another thing to avoid is starting a sentence with a numerical value. So don't start a sentence with a numerical value. So one of the ways that we could write this sentence is the potassium hydrogen phthalate was diluted to 25 mils with water. But we don't want to start off with 3.4567 grams of potassium hydrogen phthalate was diluted to 25 mils of water. Now notice too here where I'm giving the mass of the potassium hydrogen phthalate or the reagent that I used. I also need to give the millimoles or the moles that were used, but be sure to use the same number of significant figures in the moles that was used in the mass. Also when you're typing things, be sure to put two spaces between sentences. This helps the computer to recognize where it can do the spacing at. Um, so typically, so it lets the computer know that that's where a sentence is if you have two spaces. So two spaces or go between sentences. There should also be a space between the numerical value and the unit. So for example, 56.89 mils, there should be a space between the 56.89 and the mils abbreviation. Also notice that the SI abbreviation for liter is capital L. So don't use a lowercase l when you use ml. It should be lowercase m capital L. Now if you have a figure or table, you must refer to it in the text. So you can't just have a scheme for just listed in the paper and not talk about it in the text. So you have to refer to it within the writing of it if you're going to have a picture in there. So for example, the rearrangement of the isomer is shown in scheme four. Now to indicate a reference, use a superscripted number. If you are referencing the entire sentence, the number goes to the right of the period with no space. So for example, if I'm citing a reference that tells me that Americans drink 35% of their calories, I put the 9 and I make it superscript. But let's say I look up some information and I learn that Italians drink 20% of their calories. Well, I reference that information, I put the 9 next to it, but they weigh less than Americans 
that part was my conclusion based on that data so I don't reference that because that was something I concluded based on the data. Now as you look through the example paper you'll notice several different types of illustrations. First of all there's equations. Equations are mathematical equations or a chemical equation. Figures, this is some kind of picture. Um, it can either um, be drawn or some type of graph. And schemes, this is a more complicated figure and it typically shows a pathway or a mechanism. Now also in your documents on Blackboard you'll find a, a slide that shows how to format your references using the ACS style. So for a journal article you start off with the author's names, then you have the abbreviation for the journal, then you have the year in bold, separated with parentheses, the journal volumes in italics, and then you list the page numbers that were the information came from and it ends with a period. If you have a book it's the authors, the book title in italics, then the edition number if there's more than one edition, the name of the publisher, colon, and then the city and the state and the year that the book was published. Now if you have a website you need to give a name for the website, so a title for the web page, whose web page it is, the actual address, and the date that you access that web page. So here would be an example of a reference list. And here I have a journal article, a book, and a web page. Now the order of the references should be in the same order as which they use in the book. So let's say in my paper I'm referencing the Shin article first, and then later on I start talking about this environmental chemistry stuff and that's reference so this will be reference 2 and then later on I'm talking about some SO2 data Well, that's the third reference that I use so your references are listed in the order in which they're used in the paper. Now a couple things about how you cite figures and pictures because figures remember figures take a lot of time and they're very can sometimes be difficult to use um, but they also have copyright issues just like using somebody else's words so we have to be careful at how we cite them. Now if you take a drawing or a figure from a source such as a website you must cite that figure and in the caption you need to write something such as this figure was taken from reference 7 so this would be similar to quoting a source so quoting words or a sentence from someone. But let's say you redrew or recreated the figure. If you simply redrew it or recreated the figure, then simply add the superscript to indicate from which reference the idea came. So the superscript 7 indicates that the idea came from reference number 7 on your list of references. So this would be similar to paraphrasing someone's idea or words. So for example here, we've got the superscript 7 so this indicates to the reader that the author redrew figure 1 but it got the main idea or the pick idea for the figure from reference 7. Now if you create a figure without any assistance or any inspiration from another figure then you don't need to reference anything because you created because what you created is actually an original. So this completes our pre-lab lecture video for experiment 3b. If you have any additional questions please ask your lab instructor and good luck with your accuracy and precision in figuring out your unknown.